Welcome in. This is the Tuesday Not So Deep Dive episode. We have Brad Freeman on the show. Uh, we're in the new format. It's been a few weeks now. I think it's going well. Uh, if the listener uptick per episode is any indication, this is a better pace for everyone. And today we're going to be talking about Lennar Corporation. This is not the sexiest stock. We may be hey. eating our fruits and vegetables today. No. Dessert comes later. Uh, I don't know what, if Ryan has a good, you know, I'll give, I'll give a sexy intro. I mean, this is, you know, if we're in a housing bubble, we'll get to the bottom of it today. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Brad, <laughs> uh, I know Ryan and I have not followed this stock at all. Have you looked at it ever before? I I have never owned any kind of real estate play or I buying or anything like that. So no, this is a, a brand new industry to me. I, I actually, I start, my internships were all in real estate. So I shouldn't say it's a brand new industry, but it's a brand new uh, public market industry for me. Yes, hopefully we can learn a bit about the home building market, some of their unit economics today. But first, let's talk about our flagship sponsor for the Not So Deep Dives, Potential Multibaggers. You've heard us talk about them before. Potential Multibaggers is trying to find stocks that can go up 10x over the next 10 years or compound at 26% per year. You might think that is a lot, but so far their track record has actually been better than that. I wouldn't expect, you know, that, that's been a really, really strong track record and let's you can expect say, them to do well, but it, you know, the goal is 26%. Per let's year. do a little mental math here. If all of his stocks, this is just to play devil's advocate, got cut in half, yeah. his compounded return would still exceed that 26% that he's trying to achieve, right? I think so. The math, um, you know, you'd have to run that yourself with him. I think that's probably pretty close pretty to on the numbers. Uh, you know, you get a lot of stuff with this. Not only do you get strong write-ups on the new picks, they're not coming out super frequently, uh, but you're getting really detailed write-ups. And for the existing portfolio, you're getting a ton of overview and updates because you know that when you see news, stock movements and stuff like that, if you're not an expert on the companies, you might want to get an update on that. There's an overview of the week every Sunday with updates on the markets in general and the stocks and the potential multi beggars universe. And there's a chat community where you can directly ask questions to Chris, who runs the uh, runs the service. Yeah. Uh, constant communication. Constant yeah. communication if you want it. And if you don't, you don't have to as well. But if you want to become a multi and become a part of this community, you can go to Seeking Alpha, look for From Growth to Value, Google it, or go to at From Value on Twitter. Okay, before we move on, BU BU new sponsor <laughs> alert. Uh, yes, sound the horns. It's uh, you may have heard of them. Uh, yeah, this is a small little company called the Molly Fool. Uh, I should say that both all three of us have either current or um, previously, past, yeah, yeah, previously worked for them. So you know, if you say that, I, I don't know why we, we want to say that. We are friends of the company. Yeah, we are friends with the company. We talk with them all the time, but they are offering through our show uh, only ninety nine dollars for their flagship stock picking service called Stock Advisor. That's right. So the link will be in the show notes. Um, it's a like chit chat money one or something like that. It will make it really easy to find for you. So if you ever want to think about, you know, signing up for Molly Fool, they're going to give you a huge discount right now. The purpose of the Molly Fool is to make the world smarter, happier, and richer. And they believe in long-term investing. If they do their job right, they keep delivering market beating stock picks. I think they're about three X what the market has been over the yeah. past two decades. I, most All people have, have do, probably heard of the stock advisor before. Yes, you've seen the ads. They're a lot, you know, they're a very big service. But if you haven't, you know, if you've ever thought about before, this is a perfect opportunity. $99 for a full year. They have a 30 day money back guarantee. All you have to do is click the link in the show notes and enter your email. Help us out a bit. Help yourself out. Help the Molly Fool out. All right, Ryan, do you want to talk about Lennar Corporation? Yeah. So Lennar, I'll, tr I'll try. It's not an overly complex model, but there's a lot of moving parts. Um, and home building's sort of an industry we're relatively new to. So we, we're going to try to, I'm going to try to lay the foundation of um, really the, the entire company pretty thoroughly. And so Lennar is the largest home builder in the United States by revenue. Um the, they operate in 20 different states throughout the U.S., ranging from coast to coast. Uh, there's They have different segments. They break it into, I think, five different groups. Um, but there's they have Texas, they have Arizona, they have the West Coast, they have the East Coast, they have Florida. It, it's all over the place, whereas some home builders are a little niche to specific areas. Um, and so the way it works from Lennar's side is they acquire land that fits into three different buckets for them. The first category is finished land. So that is land that's ready for them to con 
begin the home construction process. The second is land under development. So in this bucket, land is probably a little less than four to five years away from getting ready to start the construction. And then the third is land that's more than four or five years away from being ready. So they still need to gain uh, approval from whatever the jurisdiction or the regulating body is to develop on that land. They might, they might have a whole bunch of planning still to go into preparing that land. And so if, if it's in the first bucket, that land gets carried on the company's balance sheet. If it's in the second or third bucket, they are actually structured as option agreements with various partners to acquire the land. So that's basically just a way of saying that's how they get the land to build on. Then once it gets into that group one or that bucket one, that's where Lennar starts to starts the building process. And so they typically hire independent contractors for most aspects of the home construction process. Um, and the the homes they are building include first-time homes, move-up homes, uh, active adult, luxury, and multi-generational. Um, and so these are all pretty much higher-end homes. For reference, the average selling price of a Lernar home was around 400000 roughly in 2020. Um, and if that doesn't sound high-end, because maybe you're in California or Washington, there are a lot of homes here in like Texas. So that is a higher-end home. And you can go ahead and look at a lot of the homes they have on their I website. Look at that website. You know those kind of scary coldest, you know, infinite cul-de-sacs of the same looking home. Um, I think that's There's what Lamar that does. <laughs> yeah. Well, they look the, you know, the exact same and you might, you know, that's kind of those pictures where they're like, Ooh, wow. What, look, look at this community. You're in, you're on these homes that all look the same. Uh, you know, it's a pretty successful business and Lamar has been doing it for quite a while. And they, uh, their services actually go well beyond the constructing process too. So you've got they they manage the marketing process so they hire consultants for like in-home walkthroughs i think they pay either on commission or on salary stuff like that and then they advertise through digital channels different listing sites all that good stuff and then once they've got a buyer they also have a financial services operation so they can uh, help with the closing of the house this includes title insurance closing services mortgage underwriting um, and then just this is basically a part of their balance sheet but it's not integral to their core business which is a they have tons of other investments. There's land investments. There's investments uh, open door. in Open Door, uh, which I'll kind of mention uh, later in the earnings. Um, and really, there's just a whole range of different things they're doing. That's not super material to their business, but it, it's there. Um, and then as far as history goes, Lenar is pretty old. So they were actually started in 1954 in Miami, Florida by Gene Fisher and Arnold Rosen. Originally, it was known as f &R Builders, I believe, for Fisher and Rosen. And then two years later, Leonard Miller joined as a co-owner. I'm assuming he bought out Gene Fisher's stake because on the company's corporate history, they never mentioned Gene Fisher again after the founding part. But um, so then Leonard Miller and Arnold Rosen were kind of running the show. And after 15 years of building up the business, they changed the name to Len R, which I believe is for Leonard and uh, Arnold, um, and took the company public in that year. So that was 1971. Uh, in 1981, they began expanding into mortgage financing. And in 2000, they acquired US Home and doubled in size. Over the last 20 years, they've added a bunch of new products, uh, different home types. And then in 2018, if you're looking at like the 2017 financials, their deliveries, their home deliveries go from like 25,000 to 45,000. That's because they merged with Cal Atlantic Homes to create the world's largest home builder, or sorry, the US might be the world's largest, but- uh, Yeah, DR Horton can, well, there was at the time, DR Horton might've passed them, but one of the two, yeah. All in all, Lennar seems like a, a really good example of what just having a steady culture and steadily doing what you're doing well for a long time, what kind of compounding that can create because today uh, it, they're still growing and they, they've been around for 70 years and pretty good stock returns, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's been, I don't know what the CAGR was, but yeah, it's been a great returns if you've held it for a long, long time. Uh, I'll hit industry. This is a pretty simple one, but I know that this can be a hot topic. So if anyone has any, I don't want to hear any actuallys on this uh, because I know it's all estimates and stuff like that. And there's always that person that's going to say, you know, um, I don't know. There, there's a lot of hot takes on this, but there was a good report out from the White House that summed it up clearly. We might link that in the show notes. Uh, but what you need to know is, I think from a high level, housing inventory is at really uh, all time low for the last decade. It's only at about three months. Meaning if there was no new homes built, we'd run out of supply in three months. And that was back in June. Prices are rising 19% year over year right now. That'll probably cool off a bit. But 
again, it's a very simple, you know, supply and demand thing. There's not enough homes out there. There's a lot of people that want to buy homes. That means the prices are going to get bid up a bit. And that is good news for home builders. And then the estimated total shortage of homes is about 3.8 million. There's a lot of other numbers that fly around out there. Some say like three, four, five, or even six. But I think the takeaway is that there's a big shortage of homes for the next like decade or something like that for what the demand is going to be from a demographic level. And the home builders are going to have to build them. Uh, for reference, Lennar delivered about 14.5 thousand, or excuse me, 14,500 homes last quarter. So 3.8 million homes is a lot, even for all the large home builders out there. And there are a ton. So competition includes DR Horton, Pulse Group, NVR, KB Homes, tons more. I don't know if it's necessarily something to focus on, but you can compare the, all the different companies to see what their margins are like, who's getting the best operating leverage, who's growing the quickest, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, the, it, to paint a picture of the this housing shortage that we're having, I believe I saw somewhere that uh, there are more real estate agents than homes for sale. Yeah. I mean, so, the regulatory stuff has been a bit insane and that White House memo kind of outlines how they hopefully want to fix that, but that's not going to come. I mean, that stuff takes years and years to happen. And one of the solutions will be for someone like Lennar uh, to, to, build, to build more. All right, let's hit management and ownership. Brad, seems like he has some interesting things here. For sure. So the executive chairman and, and Ryan was telling me before the show that he interestingly kind of runs um, the earnings calls. It was either Ryan or Brett. So sorry, it was, it was one of the two. Um, but he is the executive chairman currently, but sounds like he has a little bit more active of a role um, with leadership than most executive chairmen. He's been climbing the ladder with the company for 35 years, uh, three, five years. Uh, he's a board member for Alonzo Morning Charities, and he was also the CEO of Lennar for 21 years until 2018. Um, and, and just running down the list of, of, of leadership, you'll, you'll see a very clear trend developing that I'll explain afterwards. So Rick Betwit is the co-CEO and co-president. He's been with the company for 15 years, climbing the ladder. He's the current board of, uh, board of directors for two publicly traded companies, uh, Eagle Materials, which is a building materials company, and Five Point Holdings, which is a real estate development company. I'm gonna, um, uh, let me interject there. They own 40% of Five Point, um, Lennar does. Uh, cool. Yeah, so sorry, continue. No, good interjection, thank you. So he's a, he's a board of director. Uh, he was uh, a BOD member at DR Horton until 2003, and he was the president at DR Horton um, until kind of moving on to, to Lennar. Uh, he was the former managing partner at EVP, EVP Capital. Um, and he was part of the M&A financing team with Lehman Brothers, but we won't hold that against him. Um, so John Jaffe, co-CEO and co-president, he's been with Lennar for 38 years uh, where he started as a regional president. Uh, he's also a board of director at, uh, at Five Point Holdings, which Brett just told us they have a large stake in. Um, also Open Door and True Anthem. Um, the COO, so all, all I'll say about him is he sold his business to Lennar and then he worked for, for Lennar for 15 years, climbing the ladder until he was the COO of the company. So this trend that I'm really hitting on is their, their executive team, their management team really sticks around for a very long time. They are extremely loyal. Um, you, you don't see these kind of tenures consistently throughout executive teams very often. And it just speaks volumes to that culture aspect that Ryan was talking about before. Um, but ownership, According to their most recent proxy statement, this was in February, so it's about a half year old now. So just keep maybe a little bit of a grain of salt, but it should be pretty accurate. Uh, directors and officers own 1.8% of the Class A common stock. Keep in mind, this company is 70 years old. They've gone through several large acquisitions and, and institutions have been accumulating for seven decades. Um, so Stuart Miller, interestingly, however, owns 58% of the Class B common stock with all other directors owning 0.4%. Um, combined, and that's according to the proxy statement. And then over 90% of the, the Class A float today is held by institutions. Um, it, exactly who you'd expect at the top of the list, Vanguard with 10.5%, BlackRock with 8.2%, and a 1,000 institutional firms with, with, with a sizable stake overall. Yeah, and it, it seems like Lennar's done a great job being able to retain talent. Another interesting point is that a lot of those institutional funds um, – are starting to get into this industry or at least pouring capital into it. And so I believe they may have partnered with a lot of these investment funds as well. Um, so it's yeah, kind of like this convoluted yeah. network of financing. Yeah. Which don't makes confuse, it a little tricky. At times. Don't confuse BlackRock with Blackstone though. I've made that mistake before. Blackstone's the big, the big real estate one, but maybe BlackRock's doing it as well. Uh, you know, They're in it. 
they're nervous. Um, but yeah, that, that, uh, that management stuff is very interesting. I, I thought that was a great, um, I, we always talk about red flags. I don't know. That's like a huge positive, I think, seeing all that. But I'll hit valuation quick. Pretty simple. Market cap, $30 billion. Enterprise value, $35 billion. Brad will get to the balance sheet to talk about why uh, you might look at that trailing cash flow number and think that this company is really cheap, but they over earned on their conversion um, from earnings to cash flow in the last year. And I bet that is because they weren't building up inventory. Historically, every year before that, their conversion to cash flow has been very low. Average was like 60, 70%. Some years it's negative. So They're that's why they get a, a low multiple. Go ahead, Ryan. I would. Reading the commentary in the conference call, it seems they are trying to transition to this low inventory model, the just in time inventory to buy yeah. the land when it's more in that bucket one. They, I guess we can talk about this in the second half. They claim asset light. I'm a bit skeptical that they're, it's, I think it might be like they talk about where an asset light home builder, I think that's a bit of an oxymoron because they're, how are you ever going to escape this inventory? But Maybe, maybe they will. Uh, they they know the they know the industry better than I do. Uh, just some quick things here: EV to EBITDA of seven point four over the past twelve months. EV to earnings of about ten point five. Typically, we're uh, at least myself. I'm kind of anti net income. I usually like to look at cash flow, but for this company, I think I like using net income better. I think EV to earnings is probably my preferred metric. Uh, for tracking the valuation here at about 10.5. And then the other thing I would say, dividend yields about 1%, not that meaningful. They do buy back a bit of stock, but not too much. Again, because the cash conversion isn't that great. Ryan, do you want to hit earnings? Yeah, so there's some kind of unfamiliar nomenclature in the earnings. So I'll try to break things down. I'm sure people understand it and maybe I'm like dumbing it down more than I have to. But uh, so revenue in the second quarter, which is easy enough to understand, was 6.4 billion. That was up 22% from a year ago. The trailing 12 month revenue was around 24, 25 billion. Um, and then the two factors that are pretty important to pay attention to are the backlog and the deliveries, also average selling price, but that kind of depends on the type of home that they're selling. Um, so deliveries in the second quarter was about 14,500 homes. That's up 14% year over year. New orders increased 32% year over year with the new order value growing at 56% year over year. So prices are coming up as well. Um, and they've got roughly 25,000 homes in their backlog. Gross margin improved dramatically uh, from 21.6% to 26% in the most recent quarter. And they had $831 million in net earnings. That was growing 61% year over year. Something that's kind of interesting, they had to knock off $100 million in earnings uh, because of the mark-to-market losses on their open door investment. So that's the only caveat I'd say to having earnings be the good right. adjust for that adjust for that yeah if yeah. you if you do sort of adjusted earnings which i believe they give you um you can kind of find that multiple as well um, because obviously that mark to market as long as they're not selling doesn't really affect their cash flow and then for the fiscal year 2021 uh so this year lenar expects to deliver 62 to 64 thousand homes with an average selling price of 420 thousand that's last year the average selling price was 395 thousand i believe they're focusing still on a lot of the same home types so that's probably a sign of strong demand and then that's about it equates to 26 billion dollars in home sales revenue keep in mind they also Garner, I believe it was something around 400 million in operating earnings from their financing segment. Um, and then they're guiding for 26 and a half to 27% gross margins. So it seems like that improvement on the gross margin front is st- here to stay. Yeah. And that's a good point. The financing part of the business is very important. It's a small part of revenue, but it is highly profitable. Um, if you're really interested in this business, I would research how that works. I would be worried about how that gets affected by interest rates or stuff like that. Mm. That is more important than you would look at from revenue um, at first glance, but that's something for, you know, not this episode, Brad, do you want to wrap up the first half of the balance sheet for us? Sure. So the company's got 2.6 billion in cash on hand as of this quarter, it's got negative 800 million in net receivables, but that, that's a pretty consistent theme across uh, these large uh, nationally um, scaled home, home builders. Uh, they have another 10.4 billion in finished inventory. Um, Ryan was getting into what that bucket kind of means. Um, another eight billion in land and developments, and, and then so the, the bridge to thirty billion in market cap to thirty five billion in enterprise comes from roughly five point eight billion in senior notes and debt payable, 
Um, it also has 2.2 billion more in what it calls other liabilities. I, I dug really deeply to figure out kind of what that meant and didn't find much. Um, but its interest expense is not really too bad at $94 million as of last quarter uh, with a 4.9% average rate on that $5.8 billion in debt. Um, it's got another $2.8 billion credit facility, uh, and, and it's issued roughly $1.5 billion in new stock since November of 2020. Um, not nothing, but not not crazy, not ridiculous, but but it could get crazy. It could get ridiculous if that continues and, and stays consistent going forward. Um, unsurprisingly, this is a really, really capital intensive business. Um, so, so the debt on hand and, and the large credit revolver can kind of be expected, um, but it also means maybe there's there's somewhat of a competitive moat built because it takes so much capital, um, so many resources to to keep a business like this up and running. For sure, I agree with that. Um, I guess, or go ahead, Ryan. They've improved their liquidity position too, if I'm not mistaken. They've kind of reduced yeah. their debt load. Yeah. So they acquired Cat Atlantic 2018. That's why the share count went up that year. But they financed that. I forget the exact number with some debt, and they're trying to get that back down to a more reasonable level. And another note is that the S or S and P Global just upgraded their credit rating. So hopefully, once they get new debt, which I think will be continuing, you know, part they're going to always want to have some just for the financing part of this business where the cash flow can be bad for like a year or so sometimes. Um, hopefully the interest rate on that goes down from that 4.9% because that is a bit high compared to a lot of other companies out there. Um, and I guess one other note I'd say is that we're coming, we're recording this right when Evergrande is collapsing in China. And that was because their assets uh, that they had on there were like not there or they weren't not there. They were way too high. What was Evergrande? So, they were the real estate developer that collapsed in China or is collapsing right now. Uh, they can't pay their interest on their debt. Um, I wouldn't think that's a concern for um, Lenar. It seems like they're fine. Uh, but when you look at that inventory and the land developments, if you're an investor, you kind of have to, it's kind of hard. You have to think, okay, these are just estimates on the net worth here of that. Um, maybe look at some other factors like average selling prices, home prices in the United States, demand for homes, you know, if it's something's overbuilt, all that stuff. Um, if whether that's worth what the, what they're saying. Uh, but let's not ramble too on there. Or Brad, do you have something? Nope. Okay, uh, let's not ramble on too much there. Let's hit the ad break and we'll get back and do more analysis on Lennar Corporation. Okay, welcome back. Next up, we have anecdotal evidence. Brad, you have nothing written down here, so I'm seeing no for anything yeah. on here. Hopefully, at one at one point in my life, I will be able to afford a four hundred thousand dollars house. But at, at this point, um, I'm 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 a little short. Yes, we are not. We ourselves are not liquid enough. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe with the interest rates, we'll be fine. But uh, uh, <laughs> sixty year mortgage. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but Ryan, looks like you have something. I don't have anything here. Yeah, I looked at some of the houses on the on their website that they're kind of selling in my area. They look like pretty nice houses, um, pretty modern. Uh, that's kind of my anecdotal takeaway. Um, they also spoke, which I found interesting on the conference call about the strength that they're seeing in Texas, Florida, and Arizona. Um, they said that they're seeing a lot of migration out of the coasts into those central states, uh, especially Texas. They said their hottest market was Austin by far. Those states well, it's the tech boom. You got Elon and well, yeah. it's the Dropbox CEO there. So. Hell, and Joe Rogan. That's right. That's right. So, uh, but those states have really cheap, flat land, which yeah. makes it a little easier to build as opposed to like where we are, Washington. There's a lot of mountain ranges and a lot of barriers that make it a little tough. There's a lot of hills. It's awful. And if you've, I mean, if you've been to like Phoenix lately, you can see there's just communities and housing developments going up everywhere. So I imagine migration to those states is probably a good thing for home builders uh, if they're operating in those areas. Could be good for margins. I think that makes sense. But uh, I'll, I'll let Brad go to his future growth opportunities. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm going with the, the growth of iBuying. So kind of an indirect beneficiary, I'm thinking maybe... Um, cutting down a lot of this red tape that that has once existed for somebody building a home could make the process a lot more convenient and could make um, some some people's propensity to spend on a new home a little bit higher. And, and I mean, with, with the supply shortage that, that Brett uh, kind of outlined, I mean, three months of supply remaining, anything making that process more convenient, would, I, I think not only will feed revenue, but it'll probably also directly feed their profit margin, um, considering how supply constrained the entire industry is at this point in time. Yeah, Lenar was talking about, you know, getting more asset light, 
um, reducing those inventory levels that can hurt their cash flow. If open to a Redfin and Zillow, uh, just want to take that on. Yeah, you know, that could that could help them, uh, but I don't know how much. I, I that also impact it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any of the iBuyers buyers are buying directly from Lenar, but it helps with, and they touched on this in the conference call. It helps with liquidity for like move up. Uh, families. So families that are moving into like the second home or whatever, because I think they called it the fragile dance of selling a home while closing or like closing on a new home. And so if they really need that liquidity to sell to an iBuyer, buyer, they can get it now. And so it's kind of just making it a little more frictionless in moving up to new houses. Um, but I'll hit on my opportunity. And so this is the single family rental platform or LSFR is what they call it. And here's a quote from the conference call. They said, at the end of the quarter, LSFR formed the Upward American Venture, which was capitalized with $1.25 billion of equity from blue chip institutional investors. Uh, and then they piggybacked on it and said, just after the second quarter, they acquired more capital. And so they now said that they have positions to buy $4 billion worth of purpose-built communities. What this, does purpose built mean? I think all homes have a purpose. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I would like to see what a purposeless home looks like. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it seems to be a really big bet on single family rentals. Um, and I think a lot of this is coming from what they call the affordability crisis. There's a lot of families that are getting toward, getting to the point where they can almost buy a home and they need rentals in the process. And so uh, Lennar is really leveraging that. I believe the way it works is that they're building the, I mean, the funds are essentially financing it, paying them to do it. And they're selling these homes to professional buyers who then rent them out. I don't think they're renting them out directly. I imagine the margins yeah, are pretty Lenar, good. Yeah, I don't think Lennar is renting them out, but that could, that could help with inventory too. And Lennar yeah. doesn't have to pay the cost for the land if the funds are doing it. I believe Lennar said they're doing some of, uh, some of the financing themselves, but it's a really minuscule amount. Yeah, it makes sense. That comes back to that White House report. They said that the single family rental supply is just drastically low. And that's because of regulations in a lot of areas um, that really hurt that because uh, the bias is towards, um, oh, this might be single family. Uh, but like, you know, rentals and stuff, people have the bias to basically those big houses with one family um, that everyone loves and seems to want. But there is a need for these type of rentals and there's just none of them out there right now. So that could be a smart move for sure. Um, I'll hit mine and this is an important one, but not, I don't know if it's a growth opportunity, but they're trying to do this to unlock shareholder value and they're spinning off all of the non-core businesses. So this means none of the residential home building, or sorry, the only thing that will be left at Lennar Corporation. Um, and it's a bit vague right now. They haven't given out many details and they said it'll be coming in the next few quarters when they you know, fi finalize stuff. But the, what the remaining Lennar Corporation will be is residential home building and financial services. Um, that could change. They have talked about so moving getting, it around. It what's hasn't getting been spun finalized. off, though, like uh, the land investments? All the other stuff, uh, the, the investments, I guess, um, they were a bit vague on it. The really only number they gave is that they hope it's about five to $6 billion in assets. I think they may have some commercial interest. I think they may have some um, big like apartment communities that they want to get away from. I think they have a partnership with like, they have a lot of things. So it, it's kind of hard to tell, but the, I think the main takeaway, the yeah, the main takeaway is they're trying to get five to $6 billion of these non-core assets separated. I think they want to do that to unlock shareholder value. Uh, we'll see yeah. if that <laughs> means, means anything. Um, but I guess what will be nice is if you're an investor in this company, we get an insight into how those businesses are running compared to the stuff that's actually meaningful for Lennar as a whole. Um, let's hit highlights and lowlights though. Brad, what did you like? What did you dislike about this business? Yeah, love going back to management, love love the decades of experience and, and the ladder climbing um, conducted by pretty much every single uh, person on this executive team. Um, so I'm gonna stick with that. Uh, so because Ryan, uh, I think our, our other highlights pretty similar, but low light, um, so this is, I'm kind of reaching, there's not a lot negative to pick at, but federal house, house or the Biden administration announced that they're going to start building a lot of houses. Um, I'm not sure if Lenar will even be involved in that or not, because they could potentially be, I'm not, I'm not sure how the white house would build houses without, um, without using the help from, from private builders. Um, but I, I wonder if, 
and and again picking uh, if if just this this sh the supply shortage will eventually be overcorrected and and there will be a supply glut and that's all hypothetical the other thing i have is interest rates eventually probably will go up and that could dampen affordability um, but it could also it could also help um, if they have any net interest margin income in that financing business that, that could be a tailwind to offset it um, but yeah there's not there, I have to dig pretty deep to find a low light. It's a pretty flawlessly run company at this point in time. That's it. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. My low light is really the same. It, it's uh, basically all just speculation around macro um, that ends up being my low light. And I guess to some extent, my low light is that there's some bit of a macro bet embedded in this that uh, real estate demand will stay strong uh, and that they have to build their way out of the shortage. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think that one's pretty cut and dry. Like unless people are going to live anywhere or everyone's going to live in eight person homes, I think the real risk is interest rates because that could lower average sewing prices. But uh, that's what I was going to uh, interject with earlier. If the financing part benefits from interest rates rising, I am not sure if it does. I don't think we, I don't think any of us are. Uh, so I would look into that. If you're going to be an investor, if that can hedge that, that, you know, that, that can help as well. Yeah. My, my highlights, um, simply from everything I've read, there's a housing shortage and the only way to alleviate that is to build your way out. Uh, demand seems sustainable. Um, they seem like they have a durable runway to keep building more homes, uh, and adding incremental deliveries each year. Uh, also Lennar just checks out on pretty much every account operationally. I don't think there's any low lights from the business like no. operations no and then i have one that's kind of uh pie in the sky speculative thinking which is uh competition for land acquisition which is like there's so many people right now and so many bodies that are trying to just acquire land whether it is uh the billionaires that you've heard so much about or the funds or uh, i mean just really everyone seems john malone um, that was, oh, that, uh, he's been, that was like decades ago, but the, I guess that's kind of more speculative, but it could drive up the, the cost of land on, uh, Lennar's front. Yeah. Buffett owns a farm, right? On Nebraska, he owns yeah. a small farm. That's huge. Part. That's detrimental to yeah, Lennar. It's a huge part of his portfolio. Uh, but that is a good point. It might not matter, but it's something probably to research. If you're looking into this further, I think there's probably enough land to go around. Yeah. U S is pretty big. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I guess my highlights here are the same as you, you know, I would also though, a good run home builders are, excuse me, the good run home builders over the decades have been decent investments. Um, there's some tough times because of the macro, but through the cycles, uh, over, I guess, multi-cycle periods, if that's the right way to put it, I think you understand what I mean. They've been really strong. I'll just look at the returns for all those. So they're clearly solid businesses. Obviously, I struggle low light, same as you guys. I struggle where the business can be affected by interest rates because there's a ton of things here that could be outside of their control. Um, and that is unpredictable, like we've highlighted before. But other than that, I agree with you guys. No low lights from the business operationally. Um, let's move on to the bull case, though. Brad, what do you have for us? Yeah, I, I think the the micro bull case has pretty much been proven. Um, the management team seems really capable of delivering, uh, like, like we're saying, in a macro environment that continues to be favorable. So the bull case for me, um, kind of continuing on with this theme of macro, is that this housing shortage persists and that we struggle to build up. We struggle to build our way out of it, which means Lennar and Dr. Horton and all these companies are just going to keep building as much as they possibly can in the years to come. Um, that doesn't seem that far fetched, uh, but it doesn't seem like a guarantee either. Yeah. Ryan. Yeah. My bull case is that they have sustained demand, which drives, uh, I put 10% cash flow growth for the next 10 years. So 10% annual cash flow growth, which seems very reasonable. Um, in that case, they would be generating about 20% of their current market cap in free cash flow by 2025 or whatever, 2026, I guess yeah. at that point. Um, that that seems like it'd be a really good investment. It it typically trades around ten times earnings from uh, what I look at. Yeah, well, they bumped up. It could have just been some one time thing, but it bumped up in like 2017, 2016 to about twenty. But yeah, I wouldn't expect multiple expansion here. Um, 
I mean, just look at the cash conversion over time. It's been pretty poor, and that's because of the inventory stuff. Can they fix that like they say they're going to? Maybe, and that could be part of the bull case. But one thing I think I would be concerned about with the you know, 10% compounded cash flow growth is that I don't think it'll be just a straight line. There could be some concerns no. there on inventory buildup, stuff like that. And that's that's why these trade at 10 times earnings. I mean, um, uh, yeah, aren't home builders just notoriously cyclical? Yes, yes. I don't think we're, that's what I've heard. <laughs> uh, I, do not I mean, I looked at sure. the stock chart, it looks pretty cyclical, but that doesn't, yeah, and that's what I was kind of trying to, you know, the good run ones, it seems that there's quite a few that have been around since like the 70s and 80s, at least publicly traded. And all of them have done quite well. I bet total returns have been strong as well because they all seem to pay out dividends. Um, but your business can be affected by, uh, you know, just the housing market. Um, my bull case is similar to you guys. They keep doing what they're doing operationally. I don't think you should want any changes there. And the spinoff, you know, is successful and I guess unlocks the shareholder value, quote unquote, like they've been saying. And then on a macro front, you know, the American consumer stays in good shape like they are right now with um, a lot of, uh, I guess the stimulus checks kind of helped a bit where, you know, savings are at all time rates, or at least they were back in the spring the last time I checked. And then housing prices stay elevated. That is, it feels unpredictable for the housing prices. Um, I, I feels like it would be tough for them to drop like 30%. Um, but a lot of their growth has been from average selling price going up. So that is just a variable that you'll have to think about. Um, let's move on to bear case though. Brad, what, what do you think could go wrong here? Sure. And I'll preface this with the likelihood of this happening is extremely low. Um, but the bear case to me is the cyclicality and, and the really really ample liquidity we have in the system, very low rates and, and stimulus checks and, and all of this fun stuff um, leads eventually to another housing bubble um, where we, we have to we have to significantly pull back on, on some of the practices of, of, of building and, and financing and, and getting far less aggressive. So um, history doesn't repeat itself. That happened 13 years ago. Um, I, I like to think the Federal Reserve has put itself in, in a position to avoid this exact same issue um, in, in the future. But because the company is so well run, that's kind of where I see it. Yeah, I think they were down like 75% in the housing crisis. Yeah, so. I think uh, GFC 2.0 seems unlikely, but if it happens, go look what happened to their business or their stock at the time. It was pretty detrimental. Um, my my bear case is that, uh, I mean, there isn't a there isn't a huge bear case for me, honestly. The I guess maybe supply or demand dries up, um, the and they get back to around like pre-pandemic home deliveries of around forty to fifty thousand. Um, Average selling price, I think, is big for me. I think that I mean, what if this is a one-time bump? You know, an average selling price, and that comes down. Could they? Mar margins Could they fill it with because there's deliveries? well maybe but there's operating leverage on the average selling price i think that is a big reason why margins are going up so i think there could partly. be partly partly they talk about technology investments i don't necessarily how it's affecting the cost of wood um but maybe it there was the, there was a quote from a book that i was reading yesterday uh and it was like Cyclical, you got to give the listeners you got quality investing by Lawrence Cunningham. And I think it's it said something along the lines of cyclicals are the most dangerous when they look the most sustainable. Um, and so that's the only thing that like I fear underwriting here is that it looks like this is going to just be sustained demand for the next five years and it won't. Uh, but still, it's so sound operationally that. Yeah. I, uh, they're they're not going to get to the. I don't think they're going to be losing money anytime soon. Yeah, well, I think they had negative cash flow through a few years, like 2013, 2014. I can't remember exactly, but gosh, I don't know. It's yeah, it's tough. Now. It's tough. Well, that's the that's the bull case is that it, they've helped improve operationally. Yeah, I don't know. My bear case is very similar to you guys. It's really hard to 
put any like predictions on it because you really have no idea if housing is going to cool off. There's just too many variables. And I think that's the bear case is there's a lot of uncertainty around that part. Um, but again, I have no bear case on their execution. Uh, let's move to wrap things up more or less interested. Brad, what do you, what, what do you conclude here? Yeah. Uh, if this was for a retirement account and I was at maybe a different point in my life, I would, I would enthusiastically say more interested, but um, this doesn't really fit uh, the, the, the type of company I generally invest in. It also would require me to take more of a macro lens than I, than I usually like to take when I'm investing in a company um, because they are so not so reliable, but because interest rates and liquidity are, are really, really large drivers of their business. Um, and, and I, I, I like to take an extremely narrow view of one company at a time, extremely micro, and I don't think I can do that with this. So just pairing that with the fact that it, it really doesn't fit the, the high growth disruptor um, company that I'm looking for, uh, less interested, but but just um, admiring um, the, the results that this team has delivered for the past few decades. Yep, track record speaks for itself there. Uh, Ryan, what do, you, what do you got? I'm... It- Okay, if you have any grasp on where you think the housing market is going and where you think uh, housing supply is going, then I think you have to be more interested because it seems like the best home builder to own right now. I'm a uh, little surprised. Well, there's, there's NVR too. People love NVR. I haven't looked at that, but maybe that too. Yeah. Okay, uh, I guess it's, I should say it's the largest home builder and the culture seems to check out. The big, I, I just don't feel well equipped enough uh, or I don't feel like I've learned enough about the macro environment to make any sort of stance here. So I'm going to go right on the fence. I'm just as interested as I was. Yeah. I'm gonna, <laughs> the, uh, hot take, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, 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 this episode, uh, is not the, again, it won't be the, this is not the sexiest one We're in, uh, you know, home builders, not, a not the, not the clickbait one, but I'll, I'll go more interested but not at these levels. I or sorry, excuse me. At these at this valuation, really? the only reason I get excited about something that I believe could potentially be like a cyclical, capital intensive, something like that, is if it's at a really really cheap multiple, and you know those don't come around that often. But I don't think this is at like a below market multiple. I don't know if I have any good insights into this business. And like Ryan outlined above you're not going to get all your cash back within five years. I think one of the things I've learned in the past like year or so is that if you're going to go for something that has a little bit more of a macro risk, maybe you want more of that cash back available to shareholders within like five years or three years or something like that. I would really want like, you know, at least like 50% of the market cap back. And that is not nearly where we're trading right now. So at that point, I'm like, I'm, uh, less interested, but the business itself, I think it would move to my watch list, but it's not a high enough quality business that I think deserves to trade at a higher multiple where, you know, you look at a 10 times PE, it, that's not the same as, I don't know, what's a good example? Costco is probably the easiest example at 30. I, I think that's yeah. not too different. Um, all right. That's going to be it for Yeah. This it's program. not necessarily idiosyncratic. Like it's not unique, uh, I, I guess, in comparison to other home builders. Yeah. Maybe a basket bet makes sense. Um, but yeah, the industry is not as exciting. Yeah, I feel like the, the valuation is not as compelling as it may look at first glance, but we're going to go to stock for next week. Ryan, it is your turn. What do you have for us? Yeah. For two weeks, two weeks. I me, forgot weeks. that it was my turn. So I'm digging through the email. Well, I texted uh, you. We, we get recommended. Did you not see that? No, I must have missed it. Look at it right now and see if you you love this company. All right. I texted you this morning. If All I, right. We've got know. we've got our start for next week. Then it's Dutch Bros. I think they filed their S1. I don't know if they've gone public yet, though. I think they uh maybe, yeah, it's up like 40% today or something ridiculous like that. Hey, They're okay. valued at like five million per shack, uh, which you know, might be a bit value valuation might be high, but I know Ryan's been there before. Uh, I am uh, yes, I I have plenty of anecdotal evidence. Yeah, exactly. So that should be a fun one. Uh, but that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you all for listening. Like we said before, uh, if you like this and or excuse me, if you're interested in the Motley Fool, check out that link. It'll be in the show notes. It'll walk you through it. Use their email, help, help them out, help, uh, help yourself out, help us out. Uh, 
But remember, we are not financial advisors. Anything we say on this episode is not formal advice or recommendation. Ryan and I are general partners at Arch Capital. Arch Capital clients may hold securities discussed in this podcast. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.